Our fourth pediatric neurology lecture is about neurocutaneous syndromes. The first one that we will discuss is neurofibromatosis type 1. 90% of the neurofibromatoses involve type 1. This occurs in 1 in 3,000 live births and is an autosomal dominant condition. The features that we will discuss are as follows, and keep in mind that you need two of these to make a diagnosis. Six or more cafe LA spots over five millimeters in a prepubertal child or over 15 millimeters in a postpubertal child. Two or more neurofibromas of any type or one plexiform neurofibroma, meaning it's on a nerve, axillary or inguinal freckling, optic glioma, two or more leash nodules, which are iris hamartomas, distinctive osseous lesion, lesion such as sphenoid dysplasia, or a first degree relative with NF1 by the above criteria. I would say that on a practical level, the usual criteria that I will see in the office to make the diagnosis will be the cafe LA spots and the axillary or inguinal freckling. Occasionally, we'll have the first degree relative because a parent will also have NF1, but a lot of these kids are the first person in the family to have NF. So it's usually the cafe LA spots and the axillary or inguinal freckling that will make the diagnosis. Minor or other features that these kids may have include macrocephaly, short stature, malignant tumors, which can be of peripheral nerves, pheochromocytomas, carcinoid tumors, or adenocarcinoma of the duodenum, visual problems, including myopias or refractive errors, intellectual problems, or hypertension. These are two pictures that show some of the features that we were just discussing. The one on the left shows a neurofibromas. This is obviously a severe situation and it's rare that I see any children that will have this type of skin finding. This would be typically seen in a much older person who has had NF for a long period of time. And then on the right we have some typical cafe LA spots. Moving on to neurofibromatosis type 2. This encompasses 5 to 10 percent of the neurofibromatoses. It is also autosomal dominant with genetic origins on the long arm of chromosome 22. To make a definite diagnosis, you would have bilateral vestibular schwannomas seen with MRI or CT and a first degree relative with NF2 and either a unilateral mass of the eighth cranial nerve at an age younger than 30 years or any two of the following, a neurofibroma, a meningioma, a glioma, a schwannoma, or a juvenile posterior subcapsular lenticular opacity. So you can have either one of those two situations, the bilateral vestibular schwannomas or the first degree relative with NF2 and either one of those two things, the unilateral mass of the eighth cranial nerve or two of those other tumor types. To have a presumptive or probable diagnosis of NF2, you could have a unilateral vestibular schwannoma at an age younger than 30 years or at least one of the following, meningioma, glioma, schwannoma, juvenile posterior subcapsular lenticular opacity or multiple meningiomas, two or more, and a glioma, a schwannoma, or a juvenile posterior subcapsular lenticular opacity. This is an MRI showing what a schwannoma looks like. You can see that white mass coming there on the eighth cranial nerve. The next Neurocutaneous syndrome that we're going to talk about is Sturge Weber syndrome. Features of this syndrome include a facial capillary malformation, more, more commonly known as a port wine birthmark. 
they have abnormal blood vessels on the brain surface called a leptomeningeal angioma. 42% have glaucoma, 75% have seizures. Over time, they'll develop a focal neurologic impairment with a spastic hemiparesis, and about 83% will ultimately have cognitive deficits. Evaluation for Sturge-Weber, CT is superior to MRI for demonstrating intracranial calcifications, but the MRI is helpful for demonstrating leptomeningeal angiomas and atrophy. So both can be useful uh, in this condition. Treatment, seizure medications such as Keppra, Trileptal, and Topamax can be useful for seizure control. If they have intractable epilepsy, they may require a hemispherectomy to remove the affected side. And if they have significant ocular difficulties, they may require some sort of ocular surgery for that. Uh, these are two pictures showing features of Sturge-Weber. The baby on the left shows the typical uh, facial feature with the Fort Wine birthmark. And on the right, you can see the typical brain findings that we discussed before. We're now going to talk about tuberous sclerosis, which occurs in 1 in 6,000 to 1 in 10,000 individuals. It is an autosomal dominant condition with two loci on chromosomes 9 and 16. The diagnostic criteria include major features, which include hypomelanotic macules needing greater than or equal to 3, at least 5 millimeters in diameter, angiofibromas greater than or equal to 3, or fibrous cephalic plaque, ungual fibromas on the fingernails greater than or equal to 2, a chagrin patch found on the back multiple retinal hamartomas, cortical dysplasias, which include both tubers and cerebral white matter radial migration lines, subependymal nodules, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, cardiac rhabdomyomas, lymphangioliomyomatosis, abbreviated LAM, and angiomyolipomas greater than or equal to 2. The brain manifestations are seen in about 85% of affected children, and these include seizures, the cortical dysplasias, tumors, mental disabilities, autism, ADHD, and sleep problems. Minor features that occur include, quote, confetti skin lesions, dental enamel pits, intraoral fibromas, light patches on the retina, renal cyst, and non-renal hamartomas. To definitely diagnose someone with tuberous sclerosis, you need two major features or one major plus two or more minor features. To diagnose possible tuberous sclerosis, you need one major feature or two or more minor features. Here's some pictures. The one here on the left at the top shows the hypomelanotic lesions on the skin. The one on the left on the bottom shows these facial lesions that somewhat resemble acne but are uh, much more dense typically than that. And then over here on the right we have a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. These are our references, and this completes our lecture on the neurocutaneous syndromes.